Good Sunday morning, everyone. Good morning. Let us worship our Lord Jesus, our cornerstone on whom our lives are built upon. He is our steadfast love, our boundless peace by his gift of grace. And let no one or nothing else rule our hearts other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Our call to worship is from Psalm 116. What can we give back to God for all the good things he has done for us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on his name. We will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. We will keep the promises we've made to God in the presence of all his people. Come, let us worship. Let's all stand as we sing our songs of praise to our Lord. gift of grace what gift of grace is jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to His Oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me The night is dark but I am not forsaken For by my side and Savior He will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me no fate i dread I know I am forgiven The future sure The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and never is my plea Oh, the chains are released I can sing, I am free Yet not I, but through Christ in me With every breath With every breath I long to follow Jesus For He has said That He will bring me home And day by day I know He will renew me Until I stand With joy before the throne To this I hold My hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, but through Christ in me When the race, when the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, 
but through Christ in me. Yet not I, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's continue to lift up our songs to Jesus, our cornerstone. And on our lives, on whom our lives are built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone. We've made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord. seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil Christ alone Christ alone Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come, when He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless stand before the throne Christ alone Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the same Yes, Lord Jesus, we wholly trust in you. You are our joy, righteousness, and freedom. You are our cornerstone. We pray that our words and deeds every day always speak of you, reflect you, and glorify you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. just want to speak the name of Jesus and over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name Your name is power Your name is healing your name is 
fear and all anxiety to every soul captive by depression I speak Jesus your name is power your name is healing your name is stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire shout Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire that again your name is power your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to speak I just want to speak the name of Jesus and over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Let us pass the peace that we have in Jesus this morning to one another. Let's all be seated. We continue with our worship through our learning of our faith. How does a Christian grow in their knowledge of God and understanding of their own sin? God's perfect character and holy commands are revealed, are revealed to, to us, us in, in his word, word which, which convicts, convicts us of our sins and assures, and assures us of God's love for us in the gospel. We, we hear God's, God's word as we gather to corporate worship, worship as, we as we speak the truth, the truth in love to one another in the body of Christ, Christ and, and as, as we personally draw near to God in the in word and prayer. Let us now ask for the Lord's forgiveness for the times that we have sinned against him. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have, we have not, not loved, loved you with all, with all our, heart, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We, we have, have not, not loved our neighbor, our neighbor as, as ourselves. ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are, you are full, full of compassion and grace. And grace and you are slow, are slow to, to anger. anger. Restore to us the joy of our salvation 
bind that which is broken, give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak, Speak to, to each us. of us and let, let your word, word abide with us yes. until it has brought, brought us holy, holy, holy will. Amen. Amen. Continue to ask Jesus to speak to you at this time of personal silent prayer. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Words of grace from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The kids may now go upstairs for Sunday school, and I would like to call on Mel to come up to tell us about our first announcement, uh, first announcement this morning. Hi, good morning everyone. Um, yeah, so the ICRC Special Events Ministry would like everyone to save the date uh, for our Family Day 2023, Amazing Grace. Um, so this is from August 27, uh, here at the church parking lot, and it's gonna be from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. So um, there will be an inflatable slide, cotton candy, food, and a group game. So um, do, do, uh, Mark your calendars and uh, join us on August 27. Uh, tickets will be on sale in the foyer after service. So it's $10 for 18 years old and over, $5 for 17 to five, five to 17 year olds, and then kids under four is free. So do um, mark your calendars and join us. See you there. And just a couple more announcements. Um, Nomination starts today for elder and deacon candidates, and this will be for a period of two weeks. Uh, the nomination forms are on the table outside room 107, and you will see on the form outline what the qualifications are and what the process is. Um, so please drop the completed form in the nomination box on the table, and the last day for nominations is on September 3rd. Okay. And for VBS, which will start next Monday, August 21st, the VBS welcome package for your kids is ready for pickup today after worship uh, in room 104. Okay. And today is the last day to register for the retreat, so please do so if you haven't yet. And the final number, number of people registered by the end of today will be the final number that would be submitted to the venue. Okay. And we praise God for all his ministries that we just mentioned through Emmanuel, and we praise him for his provision for Kenya CRC. Um, there for their church land registration and office construction, uh, the Lord has provide, uh, provided um, graciously through Emmanuel and through people, brothers and sisters in Christ, close to the amount of $9,000 which we have sent over to them. Okay. Let's give all the glory and honor to him alone as we pray our prayer of thanksgiving. Father, thank you for all you have done and continue to do in and through Emmanuel with all the ministries within and outside this family. You have placed us in. Always be at the seat of our hearts as individuals and as a church for your purposes to be accomplished always at the present and for the years to come. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. John will now be reading our scripture for this morning followed by Reverend Chung to deliver God's message.
Today's scripture reading is from Proverbs 4.23, and I will be reading from Legacy Standard Bible. That's Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. This is the word of the Lord. One, two, mic test, mic test. Thank you so much. Yeah. Guard your heart. We're taking a serious break from the book of Genesis. Some of our friends are at the youth retreat. They will be home after lunch this afternoon. So we're here. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, that we can observe the Lord's day. Thank you, dear Lord, that we can worship freely. Thank you, dear Lord, for bringing our friends back from holiday, even if there was danger at some moments on the road. Thank you for safe travel back to home. We pray, Lord, for our young people who are at the retreat. Pray that you speak to them. Pray that you revive them. And pray that they get connected to you and to each other. And even now, your people prepare their hearts to listen to your word. Speak, Lord. Your people are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Proverbs has this verse, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Springs of water. Springs giving water. Springs giving out life. We make decisions all the time. When you woke up this morning, oh, it's Sunday. I don't need to go to work. I'm going to the house of the Lord. What should I wear today? I have so many clothes to pick from. You make decisions. You think, you ponder, you weigh, you decide, and that's what happened for the next many hours. Sometimes our hearts make decisions with implications not just for a day or two days, but for a long time. And we want to guard our hearts so that we make the right decisions. We want to be guarded by the Lord, led by the Lord, protected by the Lord, so that we can live a life pleasing to Him and a blessing to us and to other people. Guard your heart above everything else with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life so what kind of heart should we have today we look at three hearts that we should cultivate and three hearts that we should not cultivate the first heart is this one moses was the man of god He brought the people of God out of a land where they were enslaved, where they were in great suffering. And then Moses led them through the wilderness. At this point, when we read this passage, it was the 40th year in the wilderness and 11 months. God said, 40 years, it's just one month away. Promised land is just around the corner. Moses rehearsed with them what happened in the past years, especially year number two. Again, this is year 40th. Year number two, something happened. We were at the edge, at the border of the promised land. We could have entered the promised land at that time, but we did not. Moses said, yet you were not willing to go up but rebelled against the command of Yahweh, or the Lord, your God, and you grumbled in your tents or at home and said, because Yahweh does not like us, he hates us. That's why he has brought us out of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Our brothers have made our hearts Melt, saying, the people are bigger and taller than us. The cities are large and fortified to heavens. Legacy Standard Bible gives it literal. Hearts melt. Then use the word fear, 
afraid, lose heart, but their hearts melt. Moses said, this is the land. The people says, what land? What's it like? So they decided to send out 12 spies into the land, look at it, and came back with a report. Majority report. And there was a report. Minority report. The majority says, the land is great, but the people are greater than us. Our troubles are really great. Their, their cities are fortified up to the heavens. Doesn't mean that it reaches the heaven. It's just an expression saying it's really very high. We cannot go against them. Before we can reach the foot of the wall, we'll be done with, with arrows from the top. It's too high. We cannot conquer them. Moses said 38 years ago, we almost had the land, but because your hearts melt, the people are great. Maybe God is not so great. The walls are high. Maybe God is not so high. We cannot do it. That's what happened. The hearts melt. They stood. And then they collapsed. Fear. Afterwards, Moses died, and then Joshua, the new national leader, led them into the land. First city to conquer is Jericho, again a big city with walls very high, but the Lord delivered the city into their hands in seven days. And so they were in high morale. Hey, a big city and we did it in seven days. Easy. The next city is a small one, the city of Ai, A-I, and we don't have to send all the troops, we'll just send a few thousand, small time, small troops, we can do it. And the men of Ai pursued them from the gates as far as Shebarim, struck them down on the descent, so the hearts of the people melted and became as water, it's the same expression. Their hearts melted, became as water. What is water? Well, water, what's the shape of water? Um, if you put it in a cup, it's a shape of a cup. Put it in a bowl, it's a shape of a bowl. Take it out of the bowl, drop it, it becomes formless. It's just there, yes. That's what the melted heart is like can no longer stand up to the challenge, collapse, and formless. That is the heart not to cultivate. It's a heart overcome by fear. It's a heart immobilized, melted by fear. No, not that. Moses said 38 years ago, we were almost there. But we did not fight because our hearts melted. So we could not fight. We can't stand up. We're formless. We cannot. So we did not fight. Joshua and his troops just fought and won. And so they thought that this smaller task should be easy to accomplish. So they fought and then they failed. One did not fight because they melted first before they fight. Joshua, they fought, defeated, and then they melted as well. In both cases, the hearts melted, they collapse. If we are overcome by fear, we lose good things that the Lord has in store for us. The land could have been theirs 38 years ago. 38 years is a long time. That generation that came out of Egypt died in the wilderness. Because the Lord says, since you don't believe, since you collapse, then maybe the land is not yours, but I'll still give it to your descendants. That generation passed away. A new generation inherited the promise. King David wrote this, when evildoers came to devour my flesh, they stumbled and fell. 
Though a host encamped against me, my heart will not fear. Evildoers, the enemies, they come to do evil to me, not to bless me, but to devour or kill me. And they were many. It's a host encamped against me. My heart will not fear because, well, this is verse 2 and 3. We need to look at verse 1. Because verse 1 gives the reason, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? A host? Plenty of evildoers? Better equipped than I? Outnumbering me? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a strong defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? That is the heart to develop. Not a melted, frightened heart, but a heart that is full of courage, a courageous heart. Many years ago, there was a scientist. He lives in America. He does some very important research for that country. And then he became a Christian. He continued to be a scientist, and then he gave an account of how he uh, uh, transformed from a non-God-believing or atheistic scientist into, into a, a God-fearing scientist. And then people asked him, what a powerful story of transformation and conversion. So then, before you became a Christian, you were a scientist. You do science. After you became a Christian, you continue to do science. Scientist. So what's the difference between the two? And he said, well, after I became a Christian... I still do the same methods. I still do the same experiments. I still do the same research as a scientist. But I discovered I was more successful than before. Before, I would not publish this, this article because I'm not sure if this is correct, whether I might be discredited by my peers. But after I became a Christian, I became bolder. So I published more, and my reputation kind of, you know, went up. Was that the full story? It's part of the story. You know what he missed out? Verse 1. Verse 2 and 3, the enemies are there. I'm not afraid. Verse 1, I'm not afraid because of the Lord. He was a new Christian, of course. He could not figure out the whole. He says, well, I became bolder, so I published more, and I become better known and better respected. He couldn't figure out that it's not you. There's somebody there telling you, yeah, you can publish that. Yeah, you can do that. Yes, this is how we develop a heart of courage. You have to cultivate, develop, you know, farm, breed a courageous heart by relying on the Lord. We don't become properly courageous by deciding to be brave, to be braver, and to be the bravest among the lot. No. You always go back to the surest foundation, to the surest person who can protect you, defend you, and lead you forward. Cultivate a courageous heart, not a fearful heart, by relying on the Lord. Make sure you have the presence of the Lord. Make sure you don't walk away from the Lord, don't stray away. That's where biblical courage comes. You rely on something sure, something unchanging, something unfailing. And then you become courageous, not because you're now stronger, but because your trust in Him, capital H, Him, is stronger. And He is reliable. May the Lord help us to rely upon Him and thereby cultivate a courageous heart. The second heart we want to avoid and the second heart we want to cultivate is this, 
This is the book of Ecclesiastes. The author is King Solomon, the son of King David. Solomon was a very wise king. And as he ponders over that great question, what is the meaning of life? What can living this life yield for us? Something meaningful and long-lasting. That was what he was thinking about. And these were the things he experimented with. You can keep count. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with gladness, enjoyment, happy time. And behold, it was vanity. It was nothing. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of gladness, what does it do? That's number one. He said, I tried it. It failed. I explored with my heart how to stimulate my body with wine while my heart was guiding me wisely and how to cease simple-minded folly. What does that mean? Well, that's the old Hebrew way of saying my heart was calculated at that time. My heart was guiding me wisely. It means I didn't stumble upon wine, got drunk, and accidentally lost myself. He was saying, I saw some people, they got drunk, and they seemed very happy. And they seemed undamaged or unaffected by their problems. So I want to try it. I want to try what it's like to be simple-minded and foolish. Maybe that's where the meaning of life lies. Maybe that's where true happiness lies. So I tried wine deliberately to test out the experience of the drunken ones. That's what it means. And then he finally says, well, I found that was not the answer. So he tried something else. I built houses for myself, planted vineyards, gardens, parks. I bought male and female slaves. I got a free workforce now. I possess flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in the history of Jerusalem. Record-breaking wealth. I collected silver and gold, male and female singers, and many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me. I have my private entertainers. I don't have iPads, YouTubes, but I have live singers to entertain me. I also engage in sexual pleasures. I got many women, and I became great and wealthier than all of those before me who live in this great city. Thus I turned to all my works and the labor which I had labored to do, and behold, it was vanity. It was chasing after the wind. It's trying to grasp the wind, which no one can do. So I turned to look at wisdom. There is advantage in wisdom over foolishness or folly, as light has an advantage over darkness. And yet I know that the fate of one becomes the fate of all of them. Yes, it's better to be wise. It's better to go into your bedroom at night with the light on rather than the light off. Then you don't hurt your knee. Then you don't stumble then you don't hurt your legs and your thighs. Yes, it's better to be wise. And yet, the wise and the unwise, they all share the same fate. They will all die and pass away. It seems vain. There is nothing there. I hated all the fruit of my labor. I got the fields, I got the slaves, I got the houses, I got all the wealth. For I must leave it to the man after me when I die. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a man of folly. Yet he will have power over all the fruit of my labor. It's meaningless. I cannot keep it forever because I can't be here forever. Solomon tried many things. And these five things are being tried again by people today. There is gladness. There is numbness when you get drunk or when you take drugs. You're numb 
to reality. Yeah, and he tried work and become successful at work, accumulated a lot. He tried to be wise, to explore, having wisdom rather than not. And then, of course, he saw the fruit of his labor and he says, but I can't keep them forever. I cannot even keep my life forever. And his conclusion was, therefore, my heart turned to despair of all my labor for which I had labored under the sun. Solomon, the wise king, ended up with this. A rich person, a wise person, a powerful person, the wealthiest in the history of that city, with a despaired heart. That's the one to avoid. First Peter was written by the Apostle Peter, a disciple of Jesus Christ. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their fear, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. What's in your heart? Christ. What's in your heart? Hope. The Apostle Peter was living at a time when Christians were persecuted, not just by their neighbors, but by their government. It's not just society. It's the state as well. You can't escape. And the Apostle Peter told those who were suffering along with him in another region and says, it's okay if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. It's not okay if you're persecuted because you sinned, because you committed a crime. No, not that. In fact, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. What? You're blessed? Yes, because you've been doing the right thing. And the haters of righteousness persecute you, affirming to you that you were doing the right thing. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Exalt Christ in your heart. And that's where hope is. You must do that. Do not be troubled by... Ah, a slide is missing. Do not be troubled by the despaired heart, but developed a hope-filled heart right there. Hope, but you need Christ to make the hope solid. Cultivate a hopeful heart by honoring the Lord. Hope is not just being optimistic, that everything will work out. I promise. Me? Promise? Everything will be okay. I guarantee. Me? Guarantee? Can I control anything at all? I can't even control my tomorrow. These are promises designed to comfort. But if you want solid hope, you need to have somebody who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, who does not change. You need to sanctify Christ. Hold Him, exalt Him in your heart, honor Him. That is true hope. The Apostle Peter was in hard times. Solomon was in good times. He's got everything. He's the richest now, not just from his generation, but all generations before him within the city of Jerusalem. But he ended up despaired. The Apostle Peter, hard times, not much wealth, no gardens, no parks, no cities, no houses. But the Apostle Peter says, we can have hope in Christ. If you want to cultivate a hopeful heart, you need to honor the Lord. If you want to have the right hope, you ask the Lord. Lord, give me a word, a promise. When the Lord gives you a word, a promise, you can hope on it. If the Lord does not say it, if the Lord does not promise it, we just hope on it. We're on our own. We're being 
hopeful without real hope. But we want to be hopeful because there is real hope. Honor the Lord and thereby cultivate a heart of hope. The third that we want to look at, ah, Belshazzar, that's a king, the name of a king. Neo-Babylonian Empire. There was an old Babylonian Empire. It was there. It ruled part of the ancient world. And then it collapsed, was defeated by another. And then after some centuries, another Babylonian Empire arose. It's the new or the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And Belshazzar is the seventh king in this empire. Belshazzar threw a big party for his nobles, those important people in his kingdom. And they were drinking. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he said to bring the gold and silver vessels, which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, the greatest king of the Babylonian Empire, the new one, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the city, took away all the precious things from the temple and destroyed the temple. And the king and his nobles, Belshazzar, his wives, his concubines, drank from these holy vessels from the Jerusalem temple and they praised the gods made of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand came out and began writing on the plaster of the wall in his palace. The king's face changed. His knees were knocking against each other. It was a very strange sight to behold. He was frightened. So too, I suppose, all his guests and all his entourage and all his bodyguards and everybody else who saw the same. So the king says, quickly summon for me all the conjurers all the magicians, the Chaldeans, and the readers of the stars or the astrologers so that I can ask them, who can tell me what these words are and what they mean? So quickly his aides summoned all these people and they ran into the palace. When the king summons, you don't walk. You run into the royal hall. And they look at the wall, try to understand what it says, and finally said to the king, O king, the great king, even though you promise great reward to he who can interpret what these words mean, none of us can do it. The fear in the room increased in great proportions. The queen came in and announced, O king, may you live forever, one way. And then he said, Be not afraid. There is a man in your kingdom, a man who was designated by your forefather, the great Nebuchadnezzar, to be the chief among the magicians, among the astrologers, among the Chaldeans. He should be able to read those words and tell the king what those words mean. O king, it is at this moment that you should summon Daniel, for in him resides a spirit of the gods." And so they summoned Daniel. And Daniel came. And the king says, I'm offering great reward to he who can interpret. Daniel says, O king, you may keep your reward or give it to someone else. I do not need them. But nevertheless, I will read for you the words and tell you what they mean. And Daniel says, O king, the most high God granted the kingdom grandeur, glory and majesty to your forefather Nebuchadnezzar who ruled more than 40 years in this great empire, the longest reigning monarch during that imperial age. And because of the grandeur which God bestowed upon him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every tongue feared and were in dread before him. If he want to spare someone, he is spared. If he want to slay someone, he is slain. Everybody look up to him with great fear and trembling. But when his heart was raised up and his spirit became so strong that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. The verses that we're looking at this morning 
have the word heart. And they have the word heart in the original text, Hebrew or Greek. Sometimes when you read the English Bible, you don't see the word heart, but it's actually in there. They just kind of summarize it. Like for instance, in the NIV, instead of saying, he humbled himself in the heart, the NIV simply says, he humbled himself. They thought it redundant, but actually, it's quite valuable to retain. When his heart was raised up, ram, in the original, what does it mean? See, when somebody raised you up, it's called praise. It's called commendation. It's called recommendation. It's called endorsement. He is good. He'll be an asset to your company. But when you lift yourself up, it's called pride. King Nebuchadnezzar was so powerful for decades, it's as though his rule will never end. And he became very proud. And the Holy Bible tells us that God judged him. And of course, the historical record told us that he became insane. He lived among the animals and was like one of them. He ate grass like the ox. He dwelt under the dew of the heavens like the wild donkeys. He could not rule. Then after many years, he woke up and says, I'm not the greatest after all. The greatest is the God in heaven above. And the Lord restored his sanity. And he went back to ruling his kingdom again. An episode of madness generated by pride. His heart was raised up. And then Daniel continued, But you, Belshazzar, you're not your father Nebuchadnezzar, but like him you have not made your heart lowly. Even though you knew all of this about Nebuchadnezzar, but you have raised yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Look at the vessels, the cups, the goblets you're using. These are from the holy temple in Jerusalem. You know what that means? These things were given to the temple of the Lord to be used by the Lord. But you took them from their sacred usage and used it for entertainment to get drunk with your friends. What a blasphemous occasion this is. It's not a happy feast. It's a very dangerous, accursed feast because you're using the wrong cups. You did not give glory to the God of heaven who gave you life. You praised the gods made of silver, gold, stone, wood. You're off track. Daniel says, I will now tell you what the words are and what they mean. Mene mene tekel uparsin, Aramaic, not Hebrew. And this is what it means. The Lord God does not want you to be king anymore. Your time has come. Your kingdom will be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians, not to another Babylonian, to foreigners, the Medes, the Persians. Today, of course, Iranians. That's their ancestor, Medes and the Persians. And that very night, Belshazzar was assassinated and the kingdom was given to Darius the Mede. God's word happened because of a heart to avoid. Self-lifted, a proud heart. The Lord says, no. You insulted even the holy vessels. No, this is the end. And the Neo-Babylonian kingdom ended right there. 539 B.C., October, end. No more Babylonian emperor. No more Babylonian king. No more Babylonian empire. King David was a king. King David was powerful. He is wealthy too. But one time he sinned against the Lord God because he went after a woman who's not his wife. 
So he arranged for the husband to be killed in the battlefield. And then he kept the widow as his wife. He thought nobody knows. He thought nobody will accuse him because these are all my soldiers, my men. But the Lord sent a prophet to rebuke him. And King David repented and wrote this. For you do not delight, O Lord, in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would offer it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. Too simple to present a burnt offering. Anyone can do that. What more a king. But to surrender in your heart to the Lord and says, Lord, I am a sinner. That's difficult. It's called pride. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise or you will not reject. The Lord wants the heart to get right. He can bring all the offerings, O oh King David. You can afford them very easily. But if you don't bring your heart, then you have brought me nothing. The sacrifices of God, the sacrifices He wants is a broken spirit coming to the Lord and says, Yes, Lord, I am nothing before you. In fact, I have sinned against you. I repent. Please forgive me. That's the heart the Lord wants. Not a self-lifted heart, but a broken heart. We need to learn the discipline of having a broken heart often. I don't mean, I want to marry her, but she refused, so I got a broken heart. No, not that. Not failure at romance, but a fro broken heart where we failed before the holy God and says, Lord, I tried, but I was weak and I fell. Heart is broken because I have broken the law of the Lord, but worse than that, I broke the heart of my Savior who died for sins and sinners like me. A broken heart, a heart that cannot be broken, is not a heart acceptable to God. It is a heart that resists, that arrogates or takes over the place of God. No. We want to cultivate a heart that is broken because we are weak. If we don't sin yesterday, it doesn't mean we won't forever. If I don't sin today, it doesn't mean I won't tomorrow. We need to develop a broken heart ready to come before the Lord, confessing, repenting, and receiving renewal from Him. To cultivate a broken heart, we need to fear the Lord. Now, fear is old English. In modern English, it means revering, uh, that you hold the Lord as holy, as high, as higher, as the highest, and we honor Him and exalt Him. Cultivate a broken heart. The Lord is forgiving, but we need to access it by way of repentance, a broken heart, yes. Today, we talk about six hearts. Three of them we want to avoid. Three of them we want to pursue. We don't want to be frightened, living in fear all the time. We want courage, but courage rightly built. We don't want to be despairing of life every day. We want to be filled with hope, true hope only. We don't want to have a self-lifted, a proud heart, but we want a broken heart constantly being repaired by the Lord, constantly growing in the fear or the reverence of the Lord. All of these red lines, the red hearts, must be built upon a right knowledge of God. It cannot be done humanly. Cultivate a religious, a courageous heart by relying on the Lord because He is almighty. He can. 
cultivate a hopeful heart by honoring the Lord because the Lord is victorious. Even if he's patient, delaying the final revelation of full victory so that more can come to a saving knowledge of God. We want to cultivate a broken heart by fearing, revering the Lord because He is the Holy One. We need to know the Lord who loves you and I is almighty, that He is victorious, that He is holy, so that we may cultivate a religious, a, a courageous heart, a hopeful heart, and a broken heart. May the Lord help us cultivate a courageous heart by relying on the Lord, not on ourselves. Cultivate a hopeful heart by honoring the Lord, not some forces or material abundance. Cultivate a broken heart by fearing the Lord, the Holy One. Let's all stand as we sing our song of response. Yes, Lord, have your way in our lives. 
we want to live for you, to honor you, to revere you, and to rely upon you. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, and the love of God, the exalted Father above, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the Counselor within, be with each and every one of us, helping us to cultivate the three hearts that God loves. Blessings are pronounced this day in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for a silent prayer.